Imam al-Bukhari had a very strong memory and he says it to everyone I have memorized 100,000 ahadith of the Prophet Muhammad that are sahih and I have also memorized 200,000 that are da'if once he was going towards a town and the people in that town they heard Imam al-Bukhari is coming to the town the ulama in that town they got a little bit jealous they all came together and they said let's test him we'll play a little game on him we'll see whether he's true or not they came with 10 ulama and each sheikh came with 10 ahadith. So they came up with 100 ahadith. Now every hadith comes with a chain of narration. Now what did these 10 people do? We're going to mix up the chain of narration with the ahadith. So this person says, I'm going to take your people of that, of that hadith, I'm going to put it with my hadith. And they mixed up the whole place from right to left. And so now Imam al-Bukhari enters this, uh, this, this city, this town. And they sit him down in front of everyone, everyone gathers. This is Imam al-Bukhari, Allahu Akbar, he's coming into town. You know, everyone wanted to know Imam al-Bukhari. So the, the ten mashayikh, they sit in front of him. Have you heard of this ahadith? La a'rif. Have you heard of this ahadith? La a'rif. Have you heard of this ahadith? La a'rif. One hundred hadith, he said, I do not know any of them. The ten mashayikh who were sitting at the front, they knew. This person plays no games with the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Not for anyone, so he can show off in front of anyone and say, yeah, I do know it. No. If he doesn't hear that hadith the way the Prophet Muhammad said it, in the correct chain of narration, he says, I don't know. Now, he blows everyone away. How does he do it? After saying 100 hadith, I don't know. Oh, you, the first sheikh, you said to me the wrong narration, I'll give you the correct narration for the first hadith. For the second hadith, you mentioned this person, the correct person is this. For the third hadith, you've mixed up with that person, I'm going to give you the correct hadith. For the fourth hadith, you said this, I'm going to give you the correct hadith for that. He went to the second person, the third person, the fourth person, until he reached the ten people and he said to every single one of them, the correct hadith, in the correct order, in the correct chain of narration. What a mind-blowing memory. This is an Imam al-Bukhari. Wallahi, my brothers and my sisters in Islam, these scholars, we owe everything to them. Allah Azza wa Jal has, has promised to protect Islam. And it's with people like Imam al-Bukhari that Allah Azza wa Jal has chosen so he can protect Islam. Wallahi. Now this is an Imam al-Bukhari. One of the greatest scholars that the Ummah has ever seen in the sense that we go back to him to so many foundations in our deen. It comes back to this man. Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn Mughira bin Bardizba al-Jufi al-Bukhari. So Uzbekistan, where he is born, Bukhara is the city in Uzbekistan. But that city was famous even during that time. It was famous because people were traveling from east to west uh, for trade and commerce. There were many ulama in Bukhara at that time, in Khurasan. But the place didn't become enlightened because of the ulama at that time. People were pointing towards Sham and Hijaz for knowledge. People weren't pointing towards Bukhara or Samarkand or Khurasan and so on. But what's interesting is Imam Bukhari came and he enlightened this town. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, he began his journey in a very righteous family, very righteous family. His father passed away at a very young age. His mother was the key player in, giving, uh, in nurturing him, giving him the correct tarbiyah, giving him the correct nourishment, the upbringing to ensure that, you know what, this boy that I have named Muhammad, he would uphold the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And his mother uh, detected, she acknowledged from an early stage that this boy has something very special and we need to hold on to this. So Imam al-Bukhari Rahmatullahi Alaihi, he lost his father at a very tender age, very young age. But he inherited his father's uh, wealth, so that helped him when it came to his studies. He didn't need to work. Many of the ulama actually worked. It is recorded that before his father died, his father said, in my wealth, there is not a single gold or silver coin which is haram nor doubtful. And it was his mother, after that, uh, upheld the responsibility on her own uh, of looking after him. And she was known to be a person who was righteous and a worshipper of Allah. And this, here's a story which shows this righteousness and its effect. At a young age, very tender age we're speaking about, he lost his eyesight. 
Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, he started memorizing the Quran, listening from his mother. By the age of 10, he had memorized the Quran without the eyesight. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, his mother, she saw a dream. It was Ibrahim alayhi salam that came to her in her dream and said that Allah jalla wa ala, indeed Allah jalla wa ala has returned the eyesight of Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ismail because of the excessive weeping that you have been going through crying to Allah Jalla wa'ala, Ya Allah, this Muhammad that I gave birth to, in order for him to live up to the name of Muhammad alayhi salam, defend the deen of Allah Jalla wa'ala, he needs his eyesight back. And she kept making dua, knocking on that door again and again and again. She didn't get tired because he's her son. And subhanAllah, this eyesight, subhanAllah, when it came back, it came with extra power. But he used to write in the dark. How can you see in the dark? And he used to say, the light of the moon was sufficient for me because of the power of his eyes. He was a person of ample worship, a person who would flee and belittle the dunya, and a person who would work and go towards Allah, proceed towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that. One of the examples of his continuity and the ample worship he did was his tilawah of the Quran. It's been mentioned that he used to finish the Quran every three nights in Ramadan. Furthermore, he was known for his worship and prayer and to <coughs> pray with his heart and soul and concentration. That once he was praying and he was stung by a wasp, he continued to pray. And by the, at the end of the prayer, he looked round and said, look at this creature that's trying to harm me and distract me in my prayer. It was later discovered that he had been stung in 17 different places. SubhanAllah. And his knowledge appeared on his, in his behavior fully. It was manifest. He was a person who was extremely soft, extremely gentle and modest. And when he went to one of his shaykhs, Muhammad ibn Salam, and he went, to, went as a student to him and spoke to him, discussed, and later left. Muhammad ibn Salam afterwards commented to his students and asked, do you think that even a virgin could have more haya and modesty and bashfulness than this person? And indeed, he was referring to the bashfulness and the shyness and modesty of Imam al-Bukhari. And Hussein ibn Muhammad al samal Qandi, a scholar, said about him that he was known, Imam al-Bukhari that is, for three great characteristics. Firstly, he used to speak very little. And secondly, he had no ambitions and hopes for the possessions of other people. And thirdly, he wouldn't be concerned with the gossip and the speech which uh, revolved around people as well. And he stayed in Bukhara until the age of 18, until he went to Hajj with his mother. He exhausted all the local resources until the point he knew everything, no one was ready to teach him. So he exhausted all the knowledge locally first. So when Imam Bukhari went to Hijaz and when he met Ishaq ibn Rahawi, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Yahya ibn Ma'in, he was ready for them. When they went to Hajj, they performed Hajj and he seeked permission from his mother. And he said, my dear mother, I want to stay here and pursue my knowledge. He met some big giants there, legends of the deen of Allah Jalla wa'ala from amongst the pious uh, predecessors. But it was at that time that the environment around him, the world at that time, the Islamic world, was full of ulama, scholars and the righteous. So Imam al-Bukhari, whether in his original home territory and town, or in the world around him where he travelled, he would meet righteous scholars, he would meet leaders and imams of fiqh, of hadith, who would meet people who were imams of guidance when it came to renouncing the dunya, imams of guidance when it came to taqwa and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and being cautious and scrupulous. From them, he took ilm and his way of life. Imam Dakhili was one of the great muhaddis of his time. Imam Bukhari turns up, no one knows him. So he sits at the back. Imam Dakhili starts narrating hadith. He says, Haddasana Sufyan. Haddasana Abi Zubair an Ibrahim. Everyone's just writing with chalk or whatever they used at that time, they're writing. Imam Bukhari is sitting there. He's just observing that memorization he attained. He's just taking it all in. Piece of cake for him. He approaches his Sheikh and he said, You're saying Zubair narrated from Ibrahim. Zubair didn't even meet Ibrahim. You're saying he narrated in this hadith. Imam Dakhili became astonished. Subhanallah, to this day, no one's corrected me. Starting to panic. 
Where is this uh, young man from? And especially, subhanAllah, knowing he's from Bukhara, you don't expect a big alim to come from there either than a businessman. He said to Imam Dakhili, go and check the Sanad, Ya Sheikh. So Imam Dakhili went home, he, he checked the Sanad and he came back. The Majlis people, are, he went back. This is the uh, respect of the ulama as well. Now you say to an alim, Shaykhuna, this, this is da'if. You know better than me? <laughs> you know better than me? So Imam Dakhili went back and he found out, you know what? The chain of narration is, there is Adi, someone called Adi in the middle of that chain of narration. So he came back and he smiled at him and he said, this boy has a bright future. Subhanallah. And then he did have a bright future. He dealt with Imam Dakhili. He was ready for someone else. So Subhanallah, he, he moved on. He, uh, he met some of the prominent ulama. First and foremost, Ishaq ibn Rahawi. Second, Ali al-Madini. Makki ibn Ibrahim. Yahya ibn Ma'in. Imam al-Humaydi. Imam Ahmad ibn Hamad rahimahullah. He was one of the people that actually encouraged Imam al-Bukhari. Imam, al <coughs> Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal asked him, are you actually about to leave Baghdad and go back to Khorasan? To encourage him to stay in Baghdad, to benefit from the knowledge which is there, and to, with the qualities and potentials he had to allow those potentials and knowledge to grow there. So he received such encouragement from them. So what intrigued uh, Imam Bukhari to uh, really compile this book, to embark on that journey that would take him 16 years? What intrigued him? Because there was a deliberate attempt to fabricate hadith. But then our giants held on to the sunnah and they thought, you know what, we need to deal with these people and they dealt with them. What intrigued him was he would sit in the majlis of his sheikh, Ishaq ibn Rahawi. One day Imam Ishaq ibn Rahawi said to him, if someone would kindly compile a book that is sahih because these people that oppose the Ahlul Sunnah, they're drilling into us. They're dividing us. And they were saying, we need, we need to sort this problem. Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says, this statement stayed within my heart. Meaning this is what ignited the fire within me. And he began that journey. And so Imam al-Bukhari embarked on this journey. So he can write the second most authentic book on the face of the planet. Because of the extent that Imam al-Bukhari went through, so he can make sure that the hadith that he gets is from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not from anyone else, not from any vain desire, not from, any, not from anyone's own self. And he started to write this book. This book took him 16 years to compile. And it contains all of the sahih hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now when I mention sahih, some people, after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they lied on the tongue of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They would say, the Prophet said this, but he didn't say that. A sahih hadith is pretty much the highest of the levels, just after mutawatir. And he did not accept anything under it, which was hasan or da'if or anything that comes after that. He put into this book 7,275 ahadith. Imam al-Bukhari, he says, every time I came to put a hadith in sahih, Imam al-Bukhari, I would get up and I would perform ghusl. And I'll get up and I'll pray rak'atayn. I'll pray two rak'at. And then I'll sit and I'll write that hadith. 7,275 times Imam al-Bukhari, he made ghusl and he prayed 14,000 550 rak'at in the, in the period of just making that book. Barakah from beginning to end. This is the book. Yani if you want a hadith, go to Sahih al-Bukhari. You know? And in saying that as well, Imam al-Bukhari didn't only uh, compile this book. He also wrote many other books. But this was just one of them. And this was the most famous of them. And the one that reached us until today. He traveled, literally traveled the world just so he can get the hadith. And it's narrated, Imam al-Bukhari would travel on foot in the desert. There's no cars, no airplanes, nothing. It's just foot and camel and horse. So he would travel by foot. He would hear that someone would have a hadith there. And Imam al-Bukhari, he won't accept it until he hears it himself. So he's, he traveled for a distance of like, say two months, by foot, just to reach the, to that person and hear the hadith from him. And sometimes, if he hears the hadith and he works out that the person himself who's narrating the hadith is not of the level who the Imam, Imam Bukhari accepts for him to narrate. He doesn't even take it from him and he goes back another two months. Can you imagine? So in Sahih al-Bukhari, in that book, he narrates from 289 mashayikh. Just to give you 
an understanding of how wide and, 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 and yani how far he used to travel and how, how many teachers he had. This is an Imam Bukhari. And he went through that hardship, wallahi. All for the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had many students as well. Now Imam Bukhari was never tight in his knowledge. He used to love giving that knowledge. Why is it that Imam al-Bukhari's book, Sahih al-Bukhari, became so famous? Narrated that over 90,000 people heard it from him. The book from beginning to end. He was never ever taught in his knowledge. Wherever he would go, he would give. He would give knowledge. So Ibn Salah, he says the name of the book is Al-Jami' al-Sahih al-Musnad min umuri Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sunanihi wa ayyamihi. That's the name of Sahih al-Bukhari. An abridged collection of authentic hadith pertaining matters of the Prophet sallallahu from his practices and his times. That's the name of Sahih al-Bukhari. Imam Nawi rahimahullah says the Ummah are agreed upon that the most authentic books after the book of Allah jalla wa ala is Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah he says there is not a book under the skies after the book of Allah Jalla wa ala, more authentic than Sahih al-Bukhari after Kitabullah. Imam Ibn Khaldun rahimahullah, he says Sahih al-Bukhari is a debt upon this ummah. We all owe it back to Imam al-Bukhari. He's saying we are all in debt to Imam al-Bukhari because of the work that he has left. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, who wrote the commentary of Sahih al-Bukhari, Fathul Bari. You want to understand Bukhari? You need to read Ibn Hajar's commentary of Sahih al-Bukhari. Imam Sakhawi, the student of Ibn Hajar, he said, we're dead to Imam al-Bukhari. If he saw Fathul Bari, he would have realized we paid the debt off. <laughs> Abu Ja'far al-Qayli said about al-Bukhari that when he did compile his book, he presented it to senior ulama of hadith in, in his time, like Ali ibn al-Madini, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and Yahya ibn Ma'in. And he said, Al-Uqayli said, they accepted all his book, except there were four hadith which were discussed with some criticism. However, Al-Uqayli said, the truth and the, the, the proof is stronger on the side of Al-Bukhari. He began his book, Al-Sahih, with three chapters. And the first being, how did revelation begin? As if he wants to say to us that this religion, this way of life, its origin is revelation. And therefore, we don't take our deen and religion except from revelation. So after the revelation comes to people, the, the revelation or the, or the knowledge, the hadith that comes to people, what is their duty towards that knowledge? Their duty is to have iman and belief in that. Which is why the next chapter after that is the chapter or the book of Iman. Because a person after receiving knowledge has to submit themselves to knowledge and be humble to it and believe in it. And after a person has had Iman in the Wahy, the revelation that's been revealed, has submitted to it, has affirmed it in their heart, now a person is in need of practicing and actions which are details of the Iman he has now he needs knowledge to practice that Iman. Which is why the next chapter, the third book after that, is the book of Ilm, the book of knowledge. And it talks about the etiquettes of seeking knowledge, the importance of knowledge uh, and its significance. And then after those three chapters, he wrote in detail the hadith and narrations and knowledge about worship and how to do that, about dealings as well, for example, marriage and Sirah, life of the Prophet and Prophets. After mentioning all those chapters about worship and, and trade and dealings and lives of people and their Sirah, as he began the book with three important books or chapters which spoke about his objectives, it's only uh, relevant and that he would seal his book and conclude his book with three important chapters too. So of the three books which he concludes his book with is the book of uh, accepting the narrations and hadith which are had in it he's refuting people who would want to refute him and say that his book is of no value because a lot of the narrations are had not mutawatir by doing that he gives evidence of why accepting the had is important and part of our deen and the penultimate book in his Bukhari is 
the book of holding fast with the book and the sunnah. The previous stages of the, the whole book in its entirety speak about knowledge and practice of religions. Then he wanted to take all those previous laws and regulations to an important foundation, the foundation of holding fast to the knowledge which that has proceeded. So the person after all this knowledge doesn't get diverted into bid'ah and innovation. That a person after this knowledge has come to them wouldn't get diverted to following a person's opinion rather than the knowledge in the hadith or belittling hadith. So he wants to put it all into context of that all the knowledge that has proceeded a person is to have uh, firmness in what the practice of the sunnah and that he is to apply it with certainty and trust and conviction. The final book which he concludes the book with is the book of Tawheed, a refutation on the deviant groups and deviant ideas about Tawheed, those who challenge Tawheed with their opinions and their whims and they approach and enter into the, the, the bad and the wrong avenues of nullifying Allah's names and attributes or distorting their, them in their meanings. He quotes firstly the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal that when he was sent to Yemen he was told by the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam that you will indeed encounter the people of the book so let the first thing you call them to be the witnessing that there is no one worthy of worship uh, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he mentioned after that the hadith of Mu'adh which is where Rasulullah asks, O oh, Mu'adh, do you know what the rights of, Allah's, rights of Allah upon his slaves are? And do you know what the rights of Allah's slaves upon him are, if they do that, to the end of the hadith? And then he had a discourse using hadith about Allah's names and attributes and affirming them fully, and that was a refutation against the Jahmiyyah, the Jahamites, who did ta'atil and nullified Allah's names and attributes so that a person would be uh, by following his hadith, protected from deviation and have the aqeedah of the book and the sunnah upon the understanding of the salaf of this ummah. He died in the year 256 of the Hijri calendar and the year, which is the year 870 of the Gregorian calendar.